Turning now to your community focus, Attorney General Peter Narona was just sworn in for his second term. To the people of the state of Rhode Island, I promise you this. For the next four years, we will be your lawyer, your lawyer. We will be your voice. And the Attorney General joins me now live in studio. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, good to be with you, Kim. So that was part of your inaugural address yeah. from last week. And I've got to ask, a few people saw that, saw how impassioned you were, and they said to me, you know, that doesn't sound like the speech of someone who's just going to call it quits with politics after he's done with these four years. Do you ever see yourself running for higher office after you this? You know, well, they, the way I'd answer that is this. I mean, what I see is, um, if I sort of look back at sort of what I said and what I was trying to communicate was that in my second term as Attorney General, we're going to keep working hard for the people of the state. It's such an important job. I'm really committed to doing it well. We have a lot more to do, as I try to talk about. And uh, we're going to, you know, as I said, I think I used the words, we're going to run through the tape. That was something mm. when I was U.S. attorney, we used the same phrase, you know, sort of towards the end of President Obama's term. We're going to run through the tape, which means we're going to keep going. We've got a lot more work to do, and I'm anxious to keep doing it. So will you run for higher office uh, one day? You know, I'm not thinking about anything other than doing this job right now. I've got a long way to go, four years. Um, there's a lot to do, and that's what I'm focused on. Yeah, fair enough. I want to talk to you about these next four years. What are some of your top legislative priorities for, for this year in particular? Yeah, so, you know, in, in the legislature, um, We've got to get, you know, it's not a problem that a lot of people who aren't familiar with it pay attention to, but we've got to take on wage theft in this state. It's costing the state a lot of money. It's costing workers a lot of money. You know, wage theft is a misdemeanor no matter how much money you steal from a worker. We've got to turn that into a felony to get to dissuade that conduct. But our, my priorities go beyond the legislature. What I'm really focused on, Kim, is, is getting to a place where we understand what's causing our problems in health care and coming up with a plan to fix it. I've seen it through our analysis of the merger and the work we did with Roger Williams and Fatima a year before that. And what I'm seeing is, is that long term, our health care system can't sustain itself if we don't do at least two things. We've got to fix primary care. We've got to build a strong primary care foundation. We've got to make people want to come here to deliver primary care. We can't do that right now. We're failing in our competition with other states. And then we have to change our reimbursement model. We are not reimbursing our safety net hospitals enough so that they can sustain what they need to do to treat Rhode Island patients, particularly at Roger Williams and Fatima. If we don't fix those hospitals and others like them, the way they're being paid, they're not going to last for the long term. It's why it's so important that we took that stand uh, involving Prospect a year and a half ago, but eventually that money that we have in escrow in the bank for us to keep them going is going to run out, and I worry about what will happen at that point. I want to ask you about some specific issues. My colleague Steph Machado did a story on catalytic converter thefts, yeah. um, and last year they ballooned to more mm -hmm. than 14 in 2022. Yeah. Your office, as I understand it, is responsible for enforcing a law that would sort of penalize businesses for reselling stolen parts. But right. so far, no businesses have been hit with violations. Do you think some businesses are slipping through the cracks? Yeah, I don't think so. I think the law has changed so that now we're in a better place to, to get information from those dealers as to who's selling them the parts in the first place. And so our investigative team is, is frankly making unannounced uh, inspections of those businesses to make sure they're following the law. I mean, look, there are two ways to combat this. One is to go after the people who are stealing the catalytic converters in the first place. So we've made, made some cases there working with local law enforcement. But we have, to, we have to cut off the people who are willing to buy them illegitimately. And one of the ways to do that is just to use the typical law enforcement techniques when you're investigating a business, which is you've got to make uh, unannounced inspections and you have to use your other law enforcement techniques to make sure they're following the law. So we're in the process of getting online the system for them to track the new additional information that they have to track on the law. So I think we'll make progress there in the next few months. I wanted to ask you about what, what I would classify as a somewhat uncommon decision that your office made, declining to represent the McKee administration mm -hmm. after it was sued over the removal of the homeless encampment at the State House, yeah. which we covered extensively. Your spokesman told us, quote, not having been previously consulted in any manner regarding their decision to evict and the way those evictions would be effectuated, we declined their request for representation. Would your office have counseled them to do it differently? Yeah, I can't say that because I don't know the circumstances under which uh, that problem was being addressed. This is why it's so important, uh, candidly, to have the lawyer for the state involved as a problem develops and solutions are being proposed. 
what lawyers do is they can help evaluate a problem and, and see long term. I want to know what the ramifications are of any action that's being taken. I had the same conversations, frankly, with Governor Raimondo during, during COVID. Early on, she made some decisions that I had to defend without being consulted first. And we came to an agreement that if she wanted me to defend the state in, in these, frankly, these difficult situations, I needed to be consulted first. If she was going to close the highways down, I needed to know that. If she was going to put into place fine, fines for not complying with COVID mandates, I needed to know that so I could counsel where the line was that you should not cross. So it's a, I think it's a fairly fundamental principle that if you want someone to represent you as your attorney, you need to consult with them before you act, not afterwards. Was this the first time you had sort of had this conversation with the McKee administration? Yeah, it, frankly, it was. And I think, look, I think I think both of us learned. I think both that administration and ours learned from the situation. Look, the, the governor's free to represent himself. Governor Raimondo, frankly, did that all the time during the Camarton administration. You know, she asked us to represent them a little bit more after I became attorney general. It's really up to the governor to make that choice, uh, but my condition is this. If you want me to represent you, if you want my office to represent you, then I need to be consulted in advance as to what the decision is going to be. All right, Attorney General Peter Nerona, that's all the time that we have. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks, Kim. Good to be with you.